All right. Well, good morning, Life Point Church. Welcome to spring. Hope you all are as excited about that as I am. I'm done with winter, uh, even though we keep trying to get little glimpses of it. And then tornadoes and snow, you never know what you're going to get around Louisville. Uh, but hopefully we're moving in the right direction. I'm excited about it. Um, great, great days ahead. Um, today, man, we are we're wrapping up this, this three-week series um, titled, Wait, God Said What? Where we've been looking at these different passages of scripture where on the surface, like at first read, at first glance or first listen, it seems like wild, right? It it just doesn't seem right. It it seems like maybe it's even a bit out of God's character or it just is confusing, doesn't really make sense. Maybe it's even frustrating. But we're looking at these passages of, of scripture, taking a little deeper dive into it. And what we find is that. And it's something that we, we really need. It's what we need to hear. It's God speaking truth to us in, in a way that we need it. Sometimes it's a wake-up call. Sometimes it's very blunt and direct. And some of the things we see in Scripture are very blunt and direct. Um, as someone that kind of speaks and is that way in general, um, I like that. Other people, not so much. I'm very direct when I talk, um, especially when I get passionate about something. My kids say I have a, a tone, um, and um, I don't know really what that means, but I have one. Um, but, but in Scripture, we're looking at these things where God just says something that just really makes us step back and say, like, what? And so in the first week, we looked in um, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, um, and, and God spoke through him. And he said, he said, look, I, I'm, I'm sick of your offerings, which again, seems weird. Like we wouldn't think God would say, I'm sick of your offerings because like he put that in place, right? Like that we are to present offerings to him, but he's like, I'm sick of your offerings. And, and when we look at it, what we see is that the God's people were making these offerings just to check it off the religious checklist. When in reality, their heart was far from God. And so God was like, I'm sick of that. I don't want that mess. And what we found was that outward signs of faith, I mean, they're, they're meaningless if there's no true inward faith. Last week, we jumped over to the New Testament. Um, Isaiah's in the Old Testament. We jumped to Matthew chapter 5, um, what's known as the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus' most famous collection of teachings. And what we see is that Jesus says something that was crazy, like something that that we, didn't want, we don't want to hear. He says, I know you've heard it said to love your neighbor. We're like, cool, hate your enemy. All right, makes sense. He says, no, no, but I say, love your enemy. And I don't know about you all, but it's not always easy to love your enemy. If we take it a step further, I'd be honest and say, sometimes I don't want to love my enemy, right? It's not that it's hard. I just don't want to do it. Like, they're my enemy. <laughs> they've wronged me. They've hurt me. They've hurt somebody I love. But, but what we see is that Jesus says, no, it's different in the kingdom of heaven. If you're going to be a follower of me, right, one of my disciples, a follower of Jesus, then you have to love your enemy. It's something that we all need to hear. And we need to begin to operate that way. And if you missed either the first week or, or the second week, you can check it out on, on either Facebook or YouTube. And, uh, but today we're, we're wrapping this thing up, saving maybe the wildest and the craziest, or some might say the best for last. Um, but it gets, it gets wild today. Like it's, it's really, it's really out there, especially upon first read. So we're back in Matthew chapter five, still a sermon on the Mount. We're actually a few verses before what we, we covered last week. We're still in chapter five. And just, just a little quick background, in, in, in chapter 5, again, the Sermon on the Mount starts, we, Jesus goes into what we know as the Beatitudes. Uh, we, I did a, ser- a series probably, I don't know, six months or, ago or so called uh, Blessed, and we went over the, the Beatitudes. So if you want to check that out, you can. But then in verse 17, Jesus kind of transitions a little bit and begins to talk about the law, right? The law of Moses, the, the Ten Commandments, right? We know the Ten Commandments. And there was tons of other uh, laws 
in with that, but, but you know, you could think of it through the lens of the Ten Commandments, right? And so he's talking about this and, and, and the words of the prophets and the prophecies, and he, he's talking about all these things, and he's, he's talking a little bit about how he intersects with the law and, and how we are to operate within it, what it means. And, and then he goes on into to verse 20 through 26, and he starts off by saying, similar to what we talked about last week, he says, you've heard it said, Thou shalt not commit murder, right? One of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not kill. He said, you've heard that said. You shouldn't murder or you'll be judged. But Jesus takes it to the next level. He takes it a step beyond that. And he says, but I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister, with a follower of Jesus, another follower of Christ, if you are angry with them, you too will face judgment. So he takes it from murder to just being angry with somebody, right? And then in verse 27 and 28, he then begins to say, you know, you've heard it said that thou shalt not commit adultery, right? Another 10 commandments, good things. Don't commit adultery. Like that's a good thing to say. Don't do that. <laughs> it's not good. It's destructive. It's destructive to you, destructive to families. It's a disaster. Don't commit adultery. We would all agree with that, right? Okay, we got you. But then again, he takes it and turns it up to another level. And he says, but I tell you, Anyone who has ever looked at someone lustfully has already committed adultery in their heart. So Jesus took it beyond an action, physical action, to the eyes, to a thought, to a heart desire, beyond just an act. He's saying, I'm calling you to a higher standard, right? Which is heavy. <laughs> So, so let me just ask, how many of you have ever been, or maybe you're currently or recently been angry at another person, especially maybe another believer, right? Yeah. If you're online, throw up a hand emoji or something like that. Hand emoji will be kind of funny here in a minute. I'll, you'll, you'll, you'll catch why. Um, now, how many of you, this gets a little more awkward and personal, but you know, we're family, we're all in here together. How many of you would ever say you've ever looked at someone lustfully? Go ahead. I'm raising my hand. You know, yeah, it's okay. We're in church. None of us are perfect, right? So in reality, and these are just two commandments of the law, right? Don't commit adultery, lust. Jesus kind of tied those. Don't be angry. Murder kind of connected all these things. So what we're seeing here right now is we're not doing so hot, <laughs> right? We are not perfect. And so if you raised your hand for either of those... Or could raise your hand for any other sin or any other, other thing like that. Or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but mentally you know you should have raised your hand. You were just maybe embarrassed to do that. Um, or you're driving down the road right now. Keep your hands on the wheel. Don't raise them. It's all good. But if you raised your hand, these next two verses, as wild as they are, as um, intense as they are, they're for you. They're for me. Let's check it out, right? Why not? Here we go. Let's get into it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and 30. Drum roll. God, you said, what? If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. Throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. My iPad didn't want me to read this. It just went blank. There we go. To be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Again, what? God, you're saying, what? Like, this is, this is crazy, right? Like, like, when you really think about it, don't just read it as, oh, it's a, a Bible verse. Like, I grew up in the church, like, my entire life. I've heard this before. And so sometimes it just becomes word. But when you step back and you start actually thinking about, like, gouging your eye out, gross, intense. Like, it's, it's kind of ironic. Like, just a little bit ago when I was in my office kind of reading through this and praying, like, I was having a contact issue. And it was kind of like, I'm, like, worried, like... <laughs> Is, am I going to be up here like this the whole time? People are like, oh, bro, he didn't took this too far, <laughs> right? Um, but gouge your eye out? Cut your hand off? 
How many of you have ever cut like your finger or something? Like paper cut. If you worked at UPS for any length of time, you've had a cardboard cut, and those things are rough. He said, cut your hand off. So what, what in the world is Jesus talking about here, right? I mean, is he, does he really want us to gouge our eye out? To cut our hand off? Now, disclaimer, before we go any further, um, if you are new to LifePoint Church or fairly new, you're just tuning in for the very first time, understand you did not just step into a cult. Um, you did not. Um, I, I've been the, the lead pastor of LifePoint Church for seven years, and never once in that seven years have I ever said out loud, publicly, in a sermon, to gouge your eye out or cut your hand off. Okay? I, actually, I've never even said that in my life period to somebody. Like, just... That's not normal conversation for me. So don't worry about that. And secondly, I know some of you may have grown up in situations where like we take, you know, analogies of, you know, Jesus said to, to wash, you know, others feet and you do like a foot washing service. This is not an eye gouging and hand chopping off service. So again, deep breaths. We are good. Um, as, uh, as long as I'm at LifePoint Church, I nor LifePoint Church are ever going to encourage, support, or condone any type of bodily self-harm. Okay? Disclaimer. Any type of self-harming behaviors, we're not about. We're not here for it. So I just want to be crystal clear with that. So then, what is this passage of Scripture telling us? What is Jesus talking about, and why did he go so extreme? Right? If... If my, my eye, it says my right eye, the other version says your, your good eye, right? If your right eye causes you to, to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. He said, don't even keep it. He's like, throw it away. Is, is, does Jesus really want me to do that? If my right hand offends me, does he want me to, to just cut it off? No, <laughs> absolutely not. That's not what, what Jesus is saying right here. He, he is not speaking in literal terms. He, he's not. He, no, none of his disciples, nobody is out there gouging their eyes out and cutting their hands off. He, it, was, he was, it, was a, it was figurative, right? He wasn't speaking literally, right? So Jesus does not want his followers to do that. And, and I know that, one, because we don't see that. But two, like, for him to actually expect us to do that is really inconsistent with his message all throughout Scripture, right? I mean... It would be grossly inconsistent to what we know about God and how much he loves us and how he views us. For example, in Jeremiah 29, uh, verse 11, we read that the Lord says that he has plans to prosper us, right? For us to prosper us, not to harm us, but to give us hope and a future. In John 10, 10, Jesus states that he came to the earth not to destroy it, not to destroy you, but that you may have life. And not only would you have life, but you would have it abundantly or to the full, right? So, so God wants us to have a full, abundant life. He has a future for us. He wants to, to not harm us, but to help us. Therefore, he doesn't want us to, you know, cut off our arm, our hand, or pluck out our eyes. He doesn't want us to do those things. So again, what is he saying here? And why does he use such graphic and, and dramatic statements and so what what we're going to look at is we we look in this we're going to see that i mean there's a plenty of reasons there's a lot of things that we can pull from this passage honestly these two verses there's a lot especially when you look at the full context of, of what he's talking about here in, in chapter five in the sermon on the mount but today for for time's sake we're going to look at three things that i believe jesus was teaching and showing his followers at this time as well as us today that, that we can learn and take away from this dramatic, <laughs> intense, graphic, like kind of gives you the chills to think about um, statements. And the first thing that we see is that I believe that, that this both teaches and shows us, one, um, that God takes sin seriously. God takes sin seriously. Seriously, I mean, he really does. Think about it. If he's going to go so far as to say, as an example, to like if whatever's leading you to sin, like get rid of it, right? If it's your eye, pluck it out. If it's your hand, chop it off. Like whatever it is that's causing you to stumble or leading you to sin, right? Is that trap that gets you there? Get it out of your life at all cost, because he's saying, man, sin is a big deal. 
it's not a game. It's not something we should play with and mess with. And, you know, I, you know growing up again in the church, um, you know, one of the games that we always liked to play was, like, how close can I get to, like, what's sin, what's not sin? Like, you can come and dance around a little bit, you know. And, and part of that's just being, a, I think, a church kid growing up. And, you know, some of us as adults do that. Because, you know, sometimes the lines are gray. Or, or sometimes we know that a lot of people will say this is sin and used to try to control and manipulate people. When in reality, it's probably not. We know that. So, but, but the reality is, is, is sin is serious. It's serious business. And the reason that God makes such a big deal out of it, it I think there's two main reasons for it. One is, is that because sin is the exact polar opposite of who God is, right? And what he's about. You see, God is, is holy. That means he's perfect. Isaiah uh, chapter 6 verse 3 says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That is our God. He is perfect. He is holy. First John uh, chapter one, verse five, we read that it says that that in God is that God is light and in him is no darkness. God is light. He is good. He is pure. He is perfect. And there is no sin, no darkness, no evil in him whatsoever. So he is holy and he is the opposite of sin. And another reason along those same lines that I think that, that he takes sin so seriously is because sin is the very thing that separates us from God. Because you see, if he is holy, right, if he is truly holy, perfect, no darkness in him whatsoever, then he can't be around or about or connected to sin in any way. Therefore, in order for us to be con truly connected with God... We have to be free of sin. But are we holy? Well, by a show of hands a little bit ago, nope. <laughs> Me included. We're not. We're not perfect. There's some darkness in us. We're just not perfect. It doesn't mean you're a terrible human. I'm looking around this room right now, and I know some people that are online, beautiful, incredible people that I would trust with my life. But the reality is, is we're not perfect. We've got some sin in us. We've got some darkness. And because of that, therefore, we cannot be truly in that state with sin in our lives connected to God. Pretty intense. Hang tight. There is, there is hope. There is a way. But this is why Jesus used such extreme examples. Because if that was it for us, right? If it was just the law, he's going to say to the extreme, like, the most important thing is to be connected to, the God, to God. The most important thing is to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, you have to do anything and everything that you can to make sure that you are pure. Right? That there is no sin in you. That's why he's so extreme about it. Because God takes sin seriously. Which leads us to the next thing that we can learn and that this passage shows us and teaches us is that we should do everything we can to keep from sinning. Right? We, as people, imperfect people, we should do everything that we can to keep from sinning. Now, again, that doesn't mean chop your hand off, right? If you're, you know, if, you, if one of your issues that you struggle with is, you know, you like to grab a candy bar at the grocery store or whatever. I don't know. That's lame. But, you know, say that's what it is. Don't be like, well, God cut my hand off. That's what, that's what the Bible says. That's what Andy said. No, Andy's not saying that. Leave your hand alone. And leave it be. But we really need to get to the root of what uh, is the cause of maybe some of our outward sins and the things that we have in our lives. We have to do everything we can to eliminate it in our lives so that we can have direct access and connection to God. Right? We need to do that. And so to do that, we've got to be familiar with what are those antecedents in our life that lead to sin, right? Because sin doesn't just, just happen. Like there's always a buildup, right? There's always a, a stumbling block. There's always something there that, that gets in the way and that leads us to it. And, and for, for us, that's why Jesus is saying, hey, whatever that is, remove it. He just uses an extreme example of your hand and your eye, you know, because he's talking about lust. 
and you know, and adultery, and he's talking about murder and anger, your hands and things of that nature. He's saying if that was, if that's your stumbling block, right? If that's your struggle, get rid of them. So we have to identify those things in our life that typically lead to sin. For some of you, and for, for us, it may be that there's some things in our life that we need to actually cut out and get rid of, whether it be some toxic people, whether it be a toxic habit, whether it be an event, whether it be some technology, wh whatever it may be, it, it may be that we need to actually get rid of some things in our life. But what I think we don't think about a lot is that maybe there's some things that we have to add to our life that we need to do, that we need to pay attention to to help us to keep from sinning. For example, and I've shared this a lot, but for me personally, if I think about in my current life, what's going on, like what is the sin that I struggle with the most? It's probably anger. Like I'm quick to get angry from time to time in, in different scenarios. Like I can be the kindest you know, person ever. Like when I was at Brooklawn, kid could spit in my face and punch me and call me all kinds of names and call my mom all kinds of things and all this kind of stuff. And I could be calm, chill, is, is all get out. But it's these little things that just, man, can just set me off. And I end up saying things that I regret. You know, I don't typically do things that I regret, but I say a lot of things and posture up in a way that I'm like, man, that's, that's not right. I shouldn't be that way. I'm embarrassed by that. And it definitely wasn't Christ-like. And so I know that there's those areas in my life that I need to work on. But what I do know as I'm working on those, there are some things that I need to do to help me to eliminate that in my life. I don't have, I have some like direct control of some things, right? I know that if I don't get proper rest, I'm quicker to get angry. I know that if I'm not eating right, I'm not exercising, I'm not drinking enough water and I'm all jacked up on caffeine all the time, I'm a little more on edge. I know this. I'm not saying that drinking caffeine is a sin, but I've got to pay attention to those, those antecedents, those things that typically lead me to sin. It's weird, right? But I mean, we have to start thinking that way because there are these things in our lives, these things that we can, tr can control. Maybe it's the voices that I'm listening to in my life, right? Am I listening to people that are constantly negative and, and maybe they're aggressive and they're angry and they're getting me hyped up and ready to roll, you know? Or maybe it's the fact that, you know, when I'm not, and this is true, when I'm not walking in a relationship with Jesus like I should, when I'm not spending time in the word, when I'm not spending time in prayer, and I'm not spending time meditating and listening to what he has to say, I'm quicker to get angry. So there's things in my life that I can control, that I need to do to help me to avoid sin. And if sin is a barrier between us and God, we need to do everything we can to eliminate it. And that's one of the things we learn. Again, an extreme example, but there's some things in your life that you need to cut out, to get rid of. Some things that you need to make room and add to help you to keep you from sinning, right? We need to focus on these things. We all need to do everything that we can that's within our power to keep from sinning. But again, here's the problem. The root problem in all this is that no matter what we do, and this is gonna sound really negative off the rip, but track with me, no matter what we do or how hard we try to eliminate the sin in our lives, we are not perfect. We are never going to be able to truly eliminate every sin and everything in our life enough for us to be connected to God. Because there's still that sin that will be there. Sure, we might be able to make some progress in some areas. I can make some progress in my life towards removing anger and things like that. But it's only Christ in me that's really going to truly sanctify that and begin to progress that to become better and better and better. And so on our own, we can't meet God's standard because we're not perfect and we have to have him in our life. See, while God is holy, I'm not. You're not. While God is light and there's no darkness in him, we've got a little darkness in us, right? And therefore, on our own, we have sin. And where there's sin, there's separation from God. To be connected with God means that we are without sin. We are holy as he is holy. At the end of chapter 5, he says that we are to be perfect as God, as the Father is perfect. That's just not going to happen on our own. 
So when we read this verse, these two verses in this passage, this intense, like, hey, if, if your right eye leads you to stumble, pluck it out. Cut off your hand if it does the same thing. When we're looking at the law, right, the law of Moses, when we're looking at the Ten Commandments, all these measurements of the things that we need to accomplish and try to live up to, we're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to live up to the standard. And so the last thing that we see from this passage is that it teaches us that we desperately, desperately need a Savior. We, we need a Savior. We can't do this on our own. We can't make ourselves right before God by following the law because every time we try to follow the law, we are going to fail. We are never going to measure up to God's standards of perfection and holiness to the extent that we can actually truly be in his presence. See, Romans 3.23, right? You've probably heard it. it was the, growing up in Sunday school, it was probably one of the first like two or three verses that I memorized. That I was taught. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every single one of us. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you see, within this same passage of scripture is the most incredible news. Like, I really wish I would not have been taught Romans 3.23, like isolated, boom, that's it. I really should have been taught, and I wish I would have been taught Romans 3.20 through 24 as a group. <laughs> because there's beautiful news in it. it. It contains our hope. That, yeah, while we are all sinners and we all fall short of God's glory, which means we're not perfect, which means we te technically cannot be connected to God, the hope resides in this passage. Paul writes this, verse 20, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. No one. No one will be able to work their way to God. He says, rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law... The righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And for each and every one of us. This is incredible, beautiful news. It's, it's the best news ever. You see, the purpose of the law is to show us our sin, to reveal it to us. So when we look at like, how can I make sure that I'm not sinning and that I remove all sin from my life? And I'll say, okay, here's the things I need to do. Here's the things I, I need to avoid. And we look at it. It's overwhelming. And we're going to fail on our own every time. The law shows us our sin. But it also shows us our need for a Savior. That without a Savior, we are hopeless. And the good news is that God knew this. And he sent his son Jesus. Perfect, holy, son of God, fully God, fully man. He sent him to take on our sin, our shame, our guilt, our punishment. He took it all on himself. He did the very thing that we could not do. And he, through him, made us right before God. Removes our sin. So that when God looks at us, he sees his son Jesus. Holy. Perfect. Without sin. Without blemish. Without defect. That's how he sees you. When you've placed your faith in Jesus. It's, it's incredible news. Because through him you can be redeemed. Through him you can have a relationship with God. Connected to him. In his presence. Not because you obtained some high standard of holiness. No. I'm a screw up. I know this. I don't brag about that. I don't want to be like, yeah, I'm screwed up. Let me go do whatever the heck I want because God's got me. No, that's the opposite. Because see, when you know how much you need a savior because there's all these things and this standard that you're supposed to live up to that you can't. And it's frustrating and you want to do right and you want to glorify God, but you fail and you struggle. 
and you know that God has sent his son to take your place, it makes you want to do everything you can to remove sin from your life. It makes you want to do everything you can to glorify him and honor him in every single thing you do because everything that you have is because of him, not because of you. Without Jesus, our only hope would be trying to like gouge out our eyes and cut off our hands, trying our best to try to figure out how we could not sin. And guess what? If you pluck out your right eye, what do you still have? You got your freaking left eye. If you cut off your right hand, what do you have? Your left hand. You gouge them all out and you're blind and have no hands. What do you still have? You still have a mind. Thank God that he sent his son, Jesus. He's our hope, our only hope to be connected with him. That's what we learn from this, is that without Jesus, we have nothing. Our only hope is gouging an eye. Pretty bleak, pretty gross, pretty intense. But because of Jesus, because he is holy, we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. When we place our faith in him, we can be connected to the Father. So yeah, Jesus said that. It's wild. Interesting strategy. But effective. Got his point across. We need him. We are nothing without him. We are lost without him. And this reminds us sin is serious. That we need to do everything we can within our power to eliminate sin from our life. But ultimately we need a savior. To redeem us. To make us holy. Because on our own we're going to fail every single time so first and foremost seek him as your savior if you don't have that personal relationship with him and it's your next step i get it there's a lot of things in our world today especially within the church that would push people away from it would push people away unfortunately from god like i get it I was having a conversation with Jen not too long ago with just everything that's going on in the church and all these big name church leaders. I've heard two more of them that are screwing up and have fallen and have covered stuff up. And it's a disaster. And, and it's like, why would anyone want to be a part of the church? I mean, why? And I get that. But understand that the church is a group of flawed people that need Jesus. Things that the church may have said to you or done to you in the past is not God. I've had some of the most hateful things said to me, been shunned and rejected, felt like crap and belittled more than anywhere in my life was in the church. Maybe Bible college too. And that's sad. It's freaking sad. But understand that God is not that mess. Understand that at Life Point Church, we're going to do our very best to not be that church. But to be a church that follows Jesus' lead. To love people. To encourage people. And are we perfect? No, absolutely not. Have we screwed up in our, in our history? Absolutely, we have. But the reality is, is God loves you. And he made a way for you to be made right by sending his son, Jesus, to set you free so that you could have forgiveness, mercy, and grace. Experience his love like never before. So first and foremost, place your faith in Jesus. And then after that, seek him. Yes, we can do some things and we need to be conscious and aware. Do some things to remove sin from our life. We have to do that. We have to be aware of that. But there are some things in our life, a lot of things in our lives that are deep rooted, that are going to always be a struggle. And that's where we have to constantly seek God 
to change us, to transform us, to sanctify us, to make us more and more like him. And that doesn't happen, one, unless you have a relationship with him, and two, unless you're seeking him out, spending time with him. That's why my anger gets worse, and I'm like quick to snap. It's not really my anger gets worse. I just, I'm on edge, and I pop off easier when I'm not walking with Jesus. But it gets clear as day. I mean, I could point every single situation. Some moments I'm not proud of. But if I'm walking with him and allowing him to change me from the inside out, as well as doing some of those known things in my life that help me to be less on edge, I'll be able to move closer to him. Removing sin from my life with him leading the way. Think about this. Really think about what's in your life that's this barrier between you and God. Begin to pray through that. Begin to ask him to help you through that. Maybe it's that you don't have that relationship with him and there's exact reasons in your life of why. Step out on a limb and just ask him to start removing those things, to speak clarity into those, to speak love, that, he, that you can feel his presence. Like the Holy Spirit will work in the life of a non-believer to bring them to Jesus. So step out on a limb. If you don't believe currently, what do you got to lose? It's everything to gain. But if you are a Christ follower, ask him what is in the way. What is that sin that you're struggling with? Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. Maybe you know it and you're struggling to get rid of it or you don't want to get rid of it. Kind of like loving your enemy. You don't want to do it. You like it. Seek him out and listen to him. This is not a shame thing. Please don't hear that. Because I got my issues too. We all do. We're all on a journey together trying to be more and more like Jesus. But in order to be more like Jesus, we have to spend time with him. Let's pray. Jesus, we, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for the fact that, that it's not about us being good enough. It's not about us following the law to a T. Because if it were that, Lord, we would all, we'd all be in trouble. We'd all be so separated and far from you, it would just be miserable. But Jesus, I'm so thankful that you stepped into our story. Even though we didn't deserve it, that you died and you rose again. You took on our guilt and shame, our sin upon yourself. Defeated death and hell and raising again so that we could have life. So that we could have forgiveness. And so that we were no longer bound to upholding this standard that we would never meet. But that we could just, just come to you and place our faith in you and be redeemed through you, Jesus. Such a beautiful story. Such a beautiful truth. And I'm so thankful that it's not up to me. As we continue in a spirit of prayer, maybe, maybe you're here this morning or you're watching online at some other time or, and you've never stepped over that line of faith. You don't have that personal relationship with him. Again, I already said it, I don't want to belabor it. I just want to encourage you to just to seek him. Push everything off to the side and just know that God loves you. That he died for you. He sent his son to die for you. He sent Jesus here to walk this earth. Perfect. Experienced everything that we experienced. Went through everything that we've went through. And yet truly it was without sin. It's incredible. Because of that, he gave it all for you. So that you too could be made right before God. So that when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see your screw-ups, your failures, your flaws, and all those areas of your life that you don't want no one to know about. He did that for you. And so if you've not 
stepped over that line of faith and placed your faith and trust in him. Scripture says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God rose him from the, from the grave, that you'll be saved. So it's about confessing and believing, right? As we, as we read in, in Romans 3, right? We all have sinned. We all fall short. But because of Jesus, we can all be justified before God. Through his grace, we are redeemed. And it's through placing your faith in him. So however he leads you this morning at this time, you just talk with Jesus. Tell him you know you've got flaws, that you're not perfect. That on your own, you won't measure up to his standard and that you need a savior. Agree that he is the one and only. He's savior. He died and rose for you. Confess and believe. He says, when you do that, you are redeemed. In that moment, made whole, new, a new creation, made right before God, eternally connected to him. It's the most incredible thing ever. So you call out to him as he leads. You can do it from your seat. You can do it from your house, your car, or wherever it may be. If you have questions about that, if you want to dig a little deeper into it, I'm here for it. I'd love to talk with you, answer whatever questions you have to the best of my ability, pray with you, just listen to you, whatever you need. But maybe you're here and you are a Christ follower and, and you know that you've got some sin in your life that you need to deal with. Not because you need to do that to be made right before God because Jesus already has got you, but you need to do that to honor him you need to get rid of that sin in your life to glorify him in your life. You need to get rid of that sin so that you have just clear communication and access before God. There's no barriers, nothing blocking that. You just confess that to him. Ask him to help you to work through it. He knows that we're not we're going to struggle. He doesn't expect perfection because of Jesus. So seek him, spend time with him. Let us as LifePoint Church come our, together, right? Let's work together to eliminate this mess out of our life. You can be open and honest here. I know that's a crazy thought. It's even scary for me at times. There's still things that, you know, we, I think we hold back from all of our experience that we feel like if people know everything about us, they're going to push us away. But that's not what the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to be the safe place where we can bring the real us. That's the only way we're going to be able to continue to move forward. We bring our, present the real self to God, but also to each other so we can lift each other up and encourage. In this, in this time when Jared plays, just spend time with Jesus. Confess if you need to confess. Ask him to help you and to eliminate things in your life that you need to eliminate. Ask him to help you to do the things that you need to do. Just spend time with him. Jesus, again, we love you and we thank you. I thank you for this incredible church and these people that are here, Lord. May we truly lift each other up. May we encourage each other to be closer to you, to connect with you as a church body, Lord. May we seek you, serve you, worship you, do our best to glorify and honor you. Lord, for those that don't know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that you would just speak to them in this moment. They would release their fears, their anxieties, and just turn it over to you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the fact that you made a way for us to be made right before the Father. Not by our works, but through you. And we're so thankful for that, Jesus. May we worship you as a result. In your name we pray.
time. God, you're the name above all names, and you are worthy of all praise. So God, my heart will sing how great is our God. All right, as we continue on with our worship uh, through our tithes and our offerings here at LifePoint Church, there's a few different ways that you can give. Um, you can give here in person. Um, if you choose to do that on your way out, there's a table with a basket, some envelopes, um, you can give that way if that's how you choose, or you can go to our website, um, top right-hand corner is an online giving button. You can use text to give, or you can use our church center app. Uh, but however you choose to give, we're just so thankful that you're just giving back a portion of what God's blessed you with on mission together as a, as a church family uh, to reach as many people with the good news about Jesus as possible, uh, to help people who are in need, um, to help our community, to serve, to keep things up and operating here uh, so that we can gather together just man we're just so thankful that you're you're invested in that and a part of that so thank you all for that and um so but if you have questions about giving or or anything like that i'm here for it if you have questions about anything like seriously like feel free to come talk to me it's all good or reach out to me online i know i said i have an anger issue or whatever i'm not gonna like hulk out on you and stuff it's not like that trust me you know but um but yeah we're here for it so um um, but yeah, if you have questions about giving or anything else, you can always reach out. Now, if this is your first time here or first time watching online um, and you want to fill out a digital connection card, um, you can do that. Uh, if you just text the word CONNECT to the number 502-236-9446, it'll send you a link back when you text the word CONNECT and you click that and it'll take you into the digital connection card. It's just a way to get plugged into our system. Um, you can also get plugged into our system through the um, Church Center app. Um, you can scan the QR code or just search us up in Church Center. Uh, but yeah, just we want to get connected. We we'll get to know you um, a little bit more. Um, if you're in the Church Center app on the next in the next couple of weeks, be on the lookout for some groups that are going to be posted. If you're interested in joining a um, a life group, um, we're hoping to have two or three of those up and running here in the next couple months. So, um, but a lot of that's just going to be level of interest and in people's availability and want to do that. But I want to encourage you to dig into that. I think if, if we as a church are going to ten, continue to grow individually as followers of Jesus, grow together and begin to reach out to our community more than ever before, um, it has to start with us connecting together, right? We've got to grow together so that we can go. So, um, so I want to encourage you to, to get involved in that. If you have questions, again, obviously, I'm kind of in a loop right now about ask questions if you got them, right? So, but Church Center app is where you can sign up for those, so be on the lookout for those coming up. Um, four weeks away from Easter, so if you've got friends, family, it's a great time to invite people out to church. Um, you know, a lot of people will come to church on Easter if you ask them. Um, so um, you start asking, asking around, inviting people. You can grab some invite cards. We don't have specific Easter invite cards. But we have invite cards. Um, they can check out our website and they can look and make sure we're not creepy. Hopefully they don't watch like a portion of this, you know, sermon just like, well, let me jump in here. And there's like, he's saying cut off the hand, right? Um, so, but yeah, invite a friend or two, it'll be great. We want to have as many people worshiping together. Um, so Easter's a great time for that. Anyways, thank you all so much for being here. I love you guys. It's good to see everybody. Um, hope you all have a great rest of your day, great week. And again, if you need anything, reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, or our website. We're here for it. Love you guys. Y'all have a great week.